Good morning. Welcome. This morning, as we head into the holy season, we give thanks for the Lord providing us with his only son for our salvation. I wanted to start this morning by thanking the visible yet unseen servants in this church. Every Sunday, we have somebody peel the bell. But today is Milo. We have Sunday school teachers who provide our children with the knowledge and the wisdom to go forward in God's name. We have our outdoor greeters. Today, that's Peter Lamont. We have audiovisual and live streams, so thank you. We have a number of announcements, and you have um, your particular folder, which has the details, but I want to just cover a couple of them. The first is that the Easter lilies, which accompany this table, uh, the, the next Sunday is the last day for contributing to the Easter lilies in remembrance, and please, if there are those that you wish to remember, please talk to the office. Um, we also have the Men's Fellowship meeting tomorrow, which is a week earlier this month than normal. So please, uh, for those who are interested, keep that in mind. The Tuesday uh, morning online Zoom Bible study is resuming with Ray, wait, Ray? Ray Boomgard, okay, taking on the leadership. Um, there are details in the bulletin for all. Next week is the start of Holy Week, and we have a number of items Palm Sunday evening, there is a music as sanctuary concert in the evening. Um, please, if you are interested, check with your bulletin. Tickets for the Monday Thursday meal on March 28th, which is being held before the evening service at 7, are available. Please come to see us if you are so inclined. Good Friday, we have a morning service at 10.30 a.m., and Easter Sunday, there's a congregational breakfast at 9 o'clock. I'm kind of close to that one. So please come and enjoy. There will be plenty of food, plenty of good cheer. But remember, uh, in this case, it is prior to the service, not after the service. Don't get left out. And lastly, uh, I'd like to invite Jen Curtis up to just speak about the Easter egg hunt. Good morning, bonjour, welcome to our church. I'm gonna start with a joke. So what's an egg's favorite sport? Running. And with that, I, on that note, I encourage you to run, not walk, next Saturday to this church between two and 4 p.m. for our annual Easter egg hunt. All ages are welcome, it's catered towards children, but all ages are welcome. We'll have eggs hidden here in the sanctuary by a special Easter bunny. And down in St. Andrew's Hall, there'll be stations for children and others with games like pin the tail on the bunny, face painting, lots of refreshments. It's definitely the place to be next Saturday, March 23rd, to help kick off the Blessed Holy Week in this church. Uh, there's still lots of room for those that want to help us. You can speak to me uh, or Heather Payton anytime. We're looking for some people to help set up and just be there and be part of it. So please, um, please come. And uh, this is for Jeannie. Come, everybody. Thank you.
Our call to worship is in the bulletin. It is responsive, fall through Lent, and so I invite you to join me as we call to worship. Why are you here? I see it. You are in the right place. This is God's house. The door is open to you. I am seeking God with my whole heart, with my entire mind, with a fire burning in my bones. Let us worship God. Amen. Please be seated. Friends, we ask you 
When you study Peter's story in scripture, it's almost impossible to ignore how much he loved to ask questions. What does the parable mean? Where are you going? How many times should we forgive? Like a 10 year soldier, a tod toddler, Peter was full of questions because Peter was eager to learn. I wish we were more like that. I still have so much to learn. So we let us return to Christ with the humanity of a student and we pray together the prayer of confession. Let this be a moment of learning. Let us pray. Holy God, we long to be like Tom. We long to approach you with curiosity and open mind. Instead, we often live as we know our best. We pray that the disciples called you Rabbi T. Forgive us the times when we fail to be curious. Forgive us the moment when we imagine that our learning is done and that we have success. Like Peter, who is brave enough to ask, how many times should we forgive? May this way spark those lives of to learn. Amen. Faith. When Peter asked Jesus, How many times should I forgive? Jesus responded with abundance. That abundance exists for all of us, for you as well. No matter what you have done or left undone, no matter what lessons you have learned or are still learning, God's abundant grace exists for each one of us. God's love will never run out. So hear and believe and rest in this good news that you are forgiven, you are loved, and you are invited to serve. Thanks be to God. Amen. Now, as we turn to the children's hymn, the bulletin I know says hymn 774, but to keep us on our toes, we are singing instead hymn 201. 201, we come to ask your forgiveness.
Good morning and welcome. My name is Stacy, and I know a lot all of you, I think, because I, I teach you church school. And I'm going to be doing a little Bible story with you today. It's a story that features Jesus and Peter having a conversation. And Jesus is going to be teaching us how uh, he wants us to live. So it's going to be a story about teaching us some lessons about how, how we live in God's way uh, from Jesus. The story is going to be from the book of Matthew in the New Testament, and it's got some really fun actions. But first, I have a mission for you. I think last week and the weeks before, you've been looking for the Peter Rock, and uh, Heather has hidden it today. So would you like to see if you can find the Peter Rock? I'll give you a hint. It's somewhere like around, around this area. Do you want to go and see if you can find it? You can go and look for it. Do you know where it is? Can you find it for us? Can, do you want to go and get it and see if you can find it? Do you know where it is? Because <laughs> I'm not sure where it is. You've got to show me. Where is it? There it is! Can everybody give a round of applause? <laughs> Bravo! Now you can put it back, okay? Because it's going to be hidden in a new spot uh, next week. All right. So we're going to do a little story, and the story features Jesus. He's teaching us how to live in God's way, and Peter's going to come in the last part of the story. So I'm going to be the narrator, and then I'm going to have some actions for you, okay? So let's do the first part. So the first part of the story starts off with Jesus teaching people how to live in the way God wants us to live. He told them, if someone does something to hurt you, if you work it out with them, if you talk to them and you work it out with the person who has hurt you, then you've made a new friend. Wouldn't that be great to make a new friend, even after an argument? So the symbol for that is to give a thumbs up. Yeah, we made a new friend. Can you all do a thumbs up? Thumbs up. Very nice. You made a new friend, even though you had a fight and argument. So Jesus continued. He said, but what happens if they don't listen to you? Well, in that case, you're going to bring another trusted person, maybe another friend that you know, with you to talk to them again. And see if this trusted person, this friend, it could be a friend, a parent, a sibling maybe, can help you work things out before you bring it to like your whole group, your whole class, you know? Because if you're having an argument with someone, you don't want to spread it all around. You don't want to gossip, you know? So um, in that case, say your trusted friend, your parent, your sibling has helped you work out your argument. You're going to shake hands with your friend and your trusted person. Can you shake hands with your neighbor? Who wants to shake hands with me? You want to shake my hand? Thanks. Okay. So the next part of the story, Jesus goes on, and he says, but what if even though you've talked to your trusted person to help you sort out your argument, your fight, the person you are arguing with still doesn't want to listen to you. Oh, what a problem. Not even to the whole group. Say you brought your argument, uh, the situation of your argument, you talk with your whole group, and still you can't resolve your argument. There's nothing else you can do, I suppose. So what if you're in a situation and you, your argument isn't uh, fixed or resolved, and there's nothing else you can do? How do you show your, there's nothing else you can do? You've given up. You're going to shrug your shoulders and hold up your hands. Can you do that? Shrug your shoulders, oh, there's nothing else I can do. I've talked to everybody, even the whole group, and I'm still having an argument with someone. Okay, the next part. So Jesus said, well, I've got a message for you. Your words and your actions here on earth matter just as much as if you said them up in heaven. So that means everything we say and we do here on earth matters before God. God hears your prayers even when it's only two or three people praying together. So God hears our prayers. So how do we, uh, how do we pray? We put our hands together. Can you put your hands together? Good job. So when we pray, God hears us. So then Peter comes into the story. Peter, one of Jesus' 12 disciples, and he asks, what if the person hurts me again? How many times do I need to forgive? Seven times? Can you make seven with your hands? Seven times? I, that's a lot of times to forgive someone seven times. Wow. But guess what Jesus told him? Jesus said, you should forgive over and over and over again. And you know what? You shouldn't forgive seven times. You should forgive 
77 times. Wow, that's a huge amount. Can you try and do 77 with your, ha with your hands and fingers? I flashed them seven times. 77. That's a huge amount of times. So tell me, uh, um, so say you've, uh, you're having an argument with your friend and you got some help from a trusted adult or a sibling or even your whole group of friends to help fix your problem and resolve your argument and become friends again and you've both forgiven each other. Would you feel good? Yeah, because nobody likes to have um, sadness in their heart because they've had an argument with someone, right? No one wants to feel sad. If you're friends again, then you feel happy. And that's Jesus' message for you today. So we're going to do a, a little prayer, okay? A little closing prayer. And you're going to repeat after me, okay? So the first goes, Dear God, Dear God thank you for sending Jesus, Jesus to teach us how to take care of each other. Help me to say sorry when I hurt someone and to forgive others when they hurt me. In Jesus' name, amen. So thank you so much for helping me with the story. Let's give you all a round of applause. Bravo, bravo. Okay, are you ready for church school? Yeah, let's go. And as the children go to Sunday school, I invite you to look in the pews, pick out your Psalter. This is the red book that looks like this. Uh, turn to Psalm 119. If you are able to rise, please do. Today we're singing the third refrain, and we are singing with the choir verses 9 through 16. So Psalm 119, verses 9 through 16. And if you're able to rise for the singing of the psalm, let's do that. Good morning. My name is Stacy Huber. 
This morning's scripture reading is from the New Testament, the book of Matthew, chapter 18, verses 15 to 22. If you wish to follow along with your pew Bible, the passage can be found starting on page 19 of the New Testament. Let us pray. Teaching God, we want to learn your ways. We want to learn the ways of forgiveness. We want to learn your ways of love. That is part of why we return to your text week after week. Because we are hungry to be more like you. So as we prepare to listen to your good word, calm the noise in our minds. Center our spirits to focus on you so that we may learn and hear what we have missed in this story before. God, we want to learn your ways. Meet us here. Speak your truth. Help us listen. Amen. The book of Matthew, chapter 18, verses 15 to 22. If another member of the church sins against you, go and point out the fault when the two of you are alone. If the member listens to you, you have regained that one. But if you are not listened to, take one or two others along with you so that every word may be confirmed by the evidence of two or three witnesses. If the member refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if the offender refuses to listen even to the church, let such a one be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. Truly I tell you, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Again, truly, I tell you, if two of you agree on earth about anything you ask, it will be done for you by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered in my name, I am there among them. Then Peter came and said to him, Lord, if an another member of the church sins against me, how often should I forgive? As many as seven times? Jesus said to him, not seven times, but I tell you, 77 times. Thanks be for the word of God. Do you forgive me? Katie Shovel, in the October 2023 issue of Presbyterian Outlook, which is a publication of the PCUSA, begins an article with these words. Do you forgive me? 
And then she writes the following, and I'm going to share a bit of her article with you. Do you forgive me? The question hung in the air between my friend and myself. I had just admitted, she writes, I had just admitted fault and apologized, and I tried not to hold my breath. What if my desire for reconciliation was not returned? What if my attempts to repair the broken relationship were not reciprocated? My four little words, do you forgive me, were so full of vulnerability, hope, and pregnant anticipation. It all stemmed from a conversation that had happened a few weeks previously when Katie and her friend had a misunderstanding and stopped speaking. Katie had done what she could to make the situation right. She wanted healing. She knew the prescribed pattern, contrition, confession, absolution, reconciliation, and, and she did what she thought she needed to do. And then she waited for an assurance of her friend's forgiveness. To be honest, she said, I felt I, I needed it. <laughs> we all need forgiveness. Our flawed selves spill over and hurt the people in our lives time and again. And as we say in our Lord's Prayer, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. By God's grace, the ability to pardon one another's missteps is part of what, a big part of what holds us together. Without forgiveness, Katie writes, we would be alone. But her friend wasn't ready. She wanted forgiveness. Her friend wanted space. Forgiveness is as challenging to ask for as it is to accept. David White has this book, Consolations. The, it's about or, the power of ordinary words. And, and in her article, Katie Shovel opens up the book and she, she reads what he has to say about forgiveness. Forgiveness, he writes, is nothing short of heartache. It's difficult to practice because it, in its very asking for forgiveness, we actually draw ourselves close again to the original wound. One person might have been trying to put it out of their mind, the hurt and everything, and sometimes when you apologize, that, that opens up again. The path to forgiveness involves going into painful places. It assumes great risk. It doesn't deny damage done, but it means revisiting in it. Katie wanted forgiveness. Her friend still needed space. Forgiveness is hard work. And when it comes, sometimes once isn't enough, right? When we think about drawing closer to the wound, sometimes we make a decision in our mind to forgive someone and we think it's all good and well and then the next time we see them, they say something and it opens up again. And then we, we remember we've decided to forgive them and the emotional work has to be repeated. Sometimes years go by and suddenly you're like, oh my gosh, I'm back to that hurt. Peter asked Jesus how many times we need to forgive. There wasn't a, an, like seven, some commentaries think Jesus said 77, and some think he said 70 times seven, which is a lot. That's 490. But it really isn't a number. It's, it's meant to be just generously perfect as you can with this thing called forgiveness because, because sometimes it just has to be done over and over again. And if you are counting how many times you've forgiven, then you're probably not forgiving. You're just marking time, right? So why do we do it? Why does forgiveness matter? What does forgiveness achieve? Why is it important? Jesus says, where two or more are gathered in my name, I am there. I once took a 
conflict mediation course that started where two or more are gathered, there's bound to be conflict too. So I think Jesus knows where he's needed. <laughs> you know, sooner or later, we have different opinions. We come from different places. We disagree. Um, and, and sometimes that can hurt. And, and forgiveness is the process. Oh, I know. There's, you could probably, there are many ways to put it. But for the sake of this sermon, I, I think about it as the means by which we release the hosti- hostility between us. We let go of the hostility that is between us. And we, I suppose we let Jesus move into that space, but I'll get to that later. Katie, in her article, wrote, Without forgiveness, we're alone. And we need others. And that's why Jesus is there. When two or more of us are there, he's definitely there. We need, we need each other. And... And when hurts arise, and they do, forgiveness is needed, but it can't be demanded. And when we ask for forgiveness, or when we're asked for forgiveness, we know in our hearts that in some ways we are actually reopening the original hurt and asking for healing. I have been conscious of this in a particular way this week as I spent the last Thursday and Friday in Saskatoon as part of the working group that is charged with writing the new apology from the Presbyterian Church in Canada to the Indigenous people in this country. The National Indigenous Ministry Committee has asked for it. The confession that was written in 94 was before so much of what has come to light in recent years. And so the task of developing a renewed apology for the church's role in colonization and the operation of the Indian residential schools and everything that accompanied that, including the unmarked graves. And so here's the reality. We writing an apology, and it's a painful thing to do because it is, it is sitting down and sitting with all those wounds, indigenous and non-indigenous people in the room. And how do you even say sorry? (laughs) And how do you forgive? Teach me, Jesus. From the context of having spent so much time in the last few days in healing circles and listening to people's stories that are deeply painful, I was really struck when I looked at the passage that Tracy just, Stacy just read for us today. Sorry, Stacy. Um, see, there I need forgiveness. <laughs> Use the wrong name. Um, in, in Matthew 18, um, we, lift, we, we lift passages out, but it comes to us in the midst of a, a bigger teaching that Jesus is undertaking. The disciples at this stage are asking Jesus lots of questions. Um, he's their rabbi, he's their teacher, he's got things to tell them. And the question that, um, that starts Matthew 18 and that gives rise to, to a really long teaching of which the part we read today is just a small piece begins with uh, the disciples coming to Jesus and asking this one, so who's the greatest in the kingdom of God? A little problematic, right? Well, that's a question, though, that siblings ask when they say, oh, you, do you like my brother better than you like me? That's a question that occurs to us in the workplace when we wonder who's going to get the promotion. It's, it's human jostling for, yeah, I think, probably affirmations of things like our own worth. Who is going to be the greatest in the kingdom of God? And Jesus <laughs> begins this, this teaching by saying, you know, unless you become like a child, like the least of these, you can't enter the kingdom of God at all. It's not about the lifting up and over other people as much as entering into the experience of those who are well, children in that day among the most vulnerable in society. And he draws, you know, a little child to him, and he says, unless 
Well, he goes, if any of you cause one of these little ones to stumble, if any of you cause them to sin, well, it would be worse for you, better for you if a great millstone was fastened around your neck. Woe to the world for things that cause sin. And he says a few more things that, um, you know, if your eye causes you to sin, strike it out. And, and then he, he talks some more and he tells a parable that we sometimes call the parable of the lost sheep about the shepherd who has a hundred sheep and one of them goes missing and he goes in search. He leaves everything else behind to find the one that is gone. And as we, we look at this passage and, and where it's taking us, it is, it is speaking deeply into what it means to live well together, to address the challenges of life lived not alone, but life lived in community. And the importance not of your position of greatness in the community, but your care for one another and your vulnerability and your weakness. And it's at this point he begins to talk about when someone sins against you, the part that Stacy read today. Because that happens. And it's really, really insightful how well Jesus knows the way we act. He's like, when someone causes you hurt, you need to go and talk to them about it. You don't get to go and talk to your best friend about it and say, do you know what so-and-so did? <laughs> That's called triangulation. You talk to them about it. And honestly, sometimes that doesn't feel very safe. So um, I'm aware that sometimes it's not safe if, if the hurt is one of in extreme abuse. Um, but if you can, you go and you address it with them personally. And if they don't listen, then you take someone else with you. And it's not to bring them into the argument, it's so that with them, you can keep the focus on the relationship you have with them, because that's what matters. You know, and if that doesn't work, then you can draw the rest of the community into helping you repair your relationship. And if that still doesn't work, Jesus, you know what he says to do? He says to treat the person like a tax collector or a sinner. And, and you know, that, that might sound like you're going to cast them out, because that's what normally would happen, except that how does Jesus interact with the tax collectors? He loves them. And he raises the question of, you know, the, the little ones among us and, and their angels in heaven. And I think, as, as Stacy said with the children, Maybe the healing and the hurt isn't being resolved right now, but let's keep praying to God about it. Peter, I think Peter's starting to get it. We do Peter an injustice when we think he always doesn't get it. He knows how hard this is, and he knows that the relationship is important because he says, how many times do I have to forgive my brother? Right? He knows it's an important relationship. And that's when Jesus says, you know, 70 times 7 or 70, whatever the number is. It's not, like I said earlier, it's not about actually counting. At its core, it's about our calling to live well together. And for the community of the church that bears Jesus' name to, to do that itself. You know, we really do need other people to carry the gospel, to share the faith. Well, I can stand up here and preach, but I need you guys to listen. <laughs> All of us, the things we do together to share love, we, we can't do it on our own. We're, we're called into, into community so that together we, we bring all our gifts and our diversity and, and and even the way we live together becomes part of how we share the goodness of God among us. Now, in the article I was speaking to you about earlier on, Katie talks about the Lord's Prayer and praying for forgiveness. But somewhere else I read this week, have you ever noticed how even when you're alone, it starts our Father? We never say my Father. 
inherently the work of faith is faith and, and living in relationship is something we do together and we all maybe as i'm speaking there are painful parts in your own life that you're you're swallowing back a lump about because we all know the pain of having been hurt and 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 the other pain that comes with knowing that part of our own woundedness is that we have inflicted hurt on other people too. And as Jesus speaks about these things, the shadow of the cross is, is moving closer and closer towards them. His days are becoming shorter. We're only two weeks or so from Good Friday when we remember how the world turned against Jesus and killed him. And it was as he was dying on the cross and it felt like all the powers of the world, religious and political, were arrayed against them that Jesus said, forgive them. In that moment, he, he's asking God to remove the hostility between us and him. To, to replace it, I think, with the well, my Mennonite friends say, you know, that when you're having a conversation with someone, particularly if it's difficult, remember God is there between you. The thing about forgiveness is it's transformative. When you forgive, your enemy is no longer your enemy. Can you imagine? Sometimes forgiveness happens between two people. Sometimes the forgiveness doesn't involve conversation with them and I do need to say that because it doesn't it does not always mean returning to relationships that are harmful to you but that work of forgiveness is part of tending our own wounds and it is hard and it is actually almost impossible but I think it says somewhere else what is impossible for us is possible with God when God removes any hostility between us and God when God forgives it it brings us back into a relationship where we are not punished for what we've done wrong because we're forgiven, but we're certainly called to continue to work to make things better and to walk in new ways and try and live back into the gift of friendship. The disciples are always asking questions. <laughs> the ways of the kingdom... They unfold before them and the call to become like a child and to receive each other in vulnerability and to care. Because the relationships matter. And so we pray. Teach me, Jesus.
As we come to our prayers this morning, I have um, a prayer request for the family of Diane Bethune, who died a few days ago. Her funeral will be held April 1st at Beechwood. Um, the details we'll put in the bulletin and, and the emails over the coming days. Um, but she, has, uh, she leaves behind a daughter, Margot, a son, Andrew, and their families, and so we pray for them. And we ask that you continue to pray for them yourself this week. Come, let us pray. God of grace and mercy, God of life and love, as your spirit and love move among us and unite us in Christ this morning, we come knowing that not all is well among us and those we love and will not be as long as your creation or any of its creatures is ill or in pain. And we come placing our hope in you and who you are, remembering that through the mystery of your love, it was by, by your wounds that we are healed. And so we pray that you will breathe your spirit of life and love into relationships and communities that are sorely in need of your, your peace and your healing this day. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Shepherd of the lost, you who seek out those who are alone and those who have wandered. We know there are many in the world who keep their ailments and their pain to themselves, out of sight of those around them, afraid of rejection, afraid of being hurt again. We pray for people who have no one to speak to and are perhaps only known to themselves those hurts that might only be known by you. We pray for people who are feeling distressed, who are missing loved ones, who are facing illness. We ask that you have compassion on them and open our hearts that we might have compassion as well. As you sent Jesus Christ to heal broken lives and broken communities, we pray for those who are at work in your name in the world today. We pray for the opening of hearts that allows us to feel the pain of others and even as we pray for forgiveness and for the strength to offer it. We pray for those for whom this is so painful, who still need space. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We thank you, God, for the gift of the children of this world. We pray that you would guard their laughter, keep their hope, and when we are burnt out, full of cynicism, despair, and hostility, let them be our guide, our hope. Teach us to be like a little child in all their vulnerability once again. As we pray for the children of the world, we remember before you the indigenous peoples of this country, the terrible legacy of the Indian residential schools, the 
ongoing pain and suffering that is visited generation to generation. We boldly pray for your day of promised wholeness. We lift up to you those people who we have hurt, our own need for healing and forgiveness, those we need to forgive. And as we begin bringing these things to you, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God of life, giver of joy. Flood our paths this week with light. Turn our hearts to those around us that we might continue our journey together on this road of life. For we pray in the name of Jesus, the words he teaches us, the words that begin, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. For things that are impossible for us are possible for God. Forgiveness, grace, love poured out. And we bring our gifts, our offering, not to earn these things, but because we have already received them. We bring them in joy, and the offering we bring today is for the work of this congregation as together we seek to be God's love and presence here. The ushers, when they come around, if you have an envelope, you can put it in the plates. There are some envelopes, if you're looking for one in the pews, there are cards or notes for those of you who wish to indicate you're giving electronically, and the means to do that is printed in the bulletin, or if you're worshiping at home, it should be on the screen. Come, let us give.
And in our prayer of dedication through Lent, we are affirming our faith. It is written in the bulletin, if you would join me. We believe that questions are a building block of faith. We believe that humble curiosity can open our eyes. We believe that God is a teacher. We believe that faith invites our whole being to engage. We believe. Help our unbelief. Amen. Beloved, children of God, as you leave this place, this time, may you carry your curious heart on your sleeve. May you look for God in every face. May you find courage to get out of the boat, to speak of your faith, and when the world, if it falls apart, may you hear God's voice deep within saying, take heart, it is I, be not afraid. Go knowing this, that you are called and you are blessed. In both your ups and your downs, you always belong to God. So go now in peace, trusting in that good news. In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, together we say, Amen.